Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's message. I'm Eric, the lead pastor of South Mountain Community Church. Thank you for taking just a bit of your time to be with us today. Uh, we exist for one reason, and that's to help as many people as possible take their next step towards becoming fully devoted and fully delighted followers of Jesus Christ. And I know that for so many people, church and even religion can be messy and oh so complicated, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here you can belong before you believe. So our hope is that your first visit with us is enjoyable, meaningful, and unlike the church experiences of your past. We also think that the best way to experience delight is with others in person. So SMCC is about more than just a Sunday sermon. We have five locations for you to choose from where you can connect with people in authentic community. We want every message you hear to engage your head, your heart, and your hands for a life of full delight. So with all of that in mind, enjoy today's message. Kind of an appendix to the uh, sermon series. Why the book yeah. of Philemon? Yeah, um, I think there's some themes that connect really well with this particular weekend between the letter and that, which we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. And then additionally, we just wrapped up Colossians and Philemon is like an appendix or, or like a hidden track, basically, that the two are connected. They were written by the same person at the same time, even delivered to the same church. But Colossians was kind of written to the broader gathering, whereas Philemon was written to a more specific audience. So this is a chance to kind of, uh, I guess, listen in on a more um, smaller conversation. Great. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. All right, so my name's Trevor, serve as one of the pastors here, and I uh, just wanna say thanks for joining us on uh, you know, 4th of July weekend. And so I thought, with this being the weekend in which the United States celebrates the signing of the Declaration of Independence, it would be fitting on this weekend of all weekends to start with uh, some of the opening words from that document. So here they are. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed, by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty and freedom being one and the same. I don't know about you, but I can't read these words without hearing cabinet battle number one from the Hamilton soundtrack. It just starts floating. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We fought for these ideals. We shouldn't settle for, for less. All right, well, it's a great soundtrack. I'm just gonna throw it out there. <laughs> you make it to side B. Um, but uh, most of what I know about US history in this time period is from Hamilton. So it's all in melody, and uh, that is fun for me. But I think what the, at the very least what this document shows us is that one of the ideals that, our, uh, that the United States was founded upon, one of the ideals was that of freedom. Now, uh, truth be told, there have been missteps along the way. It hasn't always been executed perfectly. And yet, I think it's still true to say that freedom is an, a beautiful idea to commit to. And that's why part of what I'd like to explore today is really where the origins of the idea of a commitment to freedom comes from and kind of explore that idea biblically and see how it's really closely related even to this idea of forgiveness when it comes to freedom within the context of our relationships. And Philemon is the perfect letter to unpack all of that together, which we'll see as we jump into it. The letter itself explains the situation it's addressing pretty clear. So we'll get to that in just a minute, but I wanna just open up and let sort of the tension in the story uh, announce itself as the letter addresses it. So Philemon chapter one, there's only one chapter. So Philemon verse one, it starts like this. Uh, verse one, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So letters in first century Roman world, uh, they didn't send them in envelopes that had the recipient and the sender right on the top with a nice little stamp in the corner. And so the letters open by actually naming them. So Paul opens up just saying that he is the author of the letter and Philemon is the recipient. That was how they kind of did that, the standard format. But I think even within this, we can see that Paul is already beginning to address uh, and surface one of the most important themes of the letter when he calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And I think the idea that he's beginning to surface, you could put it like this, that everyone is a slave to someone. That everyone is a slave to someone. Now, quick caveat, I think sometimes when we hear the word slave, 
um, in this particular country, we oftentimes kind of uh, think of it in terms of the slavery that took place within this country in the wake of the African slave trade. And I wanna be clear that the slavery that existed within the first century Roman world was different in many different ways. That being said, I don't think it's a great thing in any uh, shape or form, uh, but the idea here is that Paul names himself specifically as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And he's saying that Jesus is the highest authority within his life, the one that he lives in obedience to. And that's significant because I think what Paul's gonna unpack throughout the letter is the idea that everyone has an ultimate authority within their lives, someone they submit to, someone they strive to live in obedience to, no matter really what your life looks like. If your life is more religious in nature, oftentimes that ends up being your religious leaders who are the ones who define the rules that you live by and the boxes that you have to check in order to be in God's good graces so that God will give you the things that you want. And if you fall short, if you break these rules or if you fail to check these boxes, then all of a sudden uh, things aren't so good with God and they're not great with these religious leaders either. And so they're the highest authority within your life. If you're irreligious in nature, sometimes, you know, I think, uh, at least today, the cultural trend is kind of to say that no one can tell me what to do or who I am, that that's something that I define for myself. And that's kind of an irreligious way of thinking. And I think what's actually true is if you get under the surface of that, if you subscribe to that way of thinking, you're actually just opting to have these modern and postmodern philosophers who develop that style of thought be the ultimate authorities within your life, because they are the ones who are leading you to live and to think in this particular way. And so religious or irreligious, we all have some authority in our lives that we choose to submit to. And what Paul is gonna go on to ask Philemon here in this letter is who is your authority and what does that lead to within your life? But we'll get to that in just a minute. So first, before Paul surfaces that, he opens up, continues to stick just to the standard format, which is a prayer. After naming author and recipient, you would offer a prayer of thankfulness on behalf of those you're writing to. And that is what Paul does for Philemon. Verse four, he says, I always thank my God, as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. He's saying, I thank God because of your love for other men and women who have trusted in Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. He's saying, I pray that our relationship would lead you to understand to an even greater degree, to an even greater and more significant depth, what we share relationally with each other because of Jesus. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. In other words, Paul basically says, I'm thankful that for the love that you have for your fellow brothers and sisters, men and women who have trusted in Jesus, and I pray that that would continue to grow as a result of our relationship. And the word share there is a significant word. Outside of the kind of New Testament context in the first century, it was just a common word. It was the Greek word's koinonia, and it didn't have any special significance outside of the New Testament, but it's a word that Paul likes a lot. And so he picks it up throughout his writings and infuses it kind of with this special meaning. It's a word that he uses to try and get at, trying to describe or even sculpt an understanding of the closeness of relationship that followers of Jesus have with one another. And he's praying that Philemon's understanding of this type of relationship would continue to grow, the intimacy, the closeness, the proximity, right, that that would continue to develop within his understanding. And again, Paul isn't just wasting fancy words, he's setting up the theme that he's about to address. And then directly after this, he flows right into the situation, the circumstances that he's actually writing to address. So in verse eight, Paul finally gets around to it, and this is what he says, therefore, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. The entire letter is about Onesimus. Paul says, who became my son while I was in chains. Paul's in house arrest in the city of Rome for his faith in Jesus. He's saying, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. 
Paul is writing on behalf of Onesimus. And here he finally addresses what he is writing about. He hasn't made his appeal yet, and yet we begin to get some of the backstory here. And what we find is that Onesimus in Philemon actually had a relationship prior to this letter. And what we know from the rest of the letter is that Onesimus was actually a slave of Philemon's. But this was the relationship they shared. And yet at a certain point, Onesimus ran away from Philemon, and in doing so, there's some indication that he might have actually even stolen from him in order to fund his escape. He later on made his way to the city of Rome, somehow met Paul, was introduced to Jesus, placed his trust in him, and now Paul is encouraging Onesimus to begin to repair this relationship. And so he's writing to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. In other words, what Paul was kind of underlined, the logic he's developed so far with his prayer, with his thankfulness and addressing this situation, even the language he uses, calling Onesimus his son and Philemon his brother, is the underlying logic is that if you've been connected to Jesus, you've also been connected to every other person who's trusted in him. The New Testament often uses familial language to get at this, talking about men and women who've trusted in Jesus as brothers and sisters. Or you see it even within this letter. And that's what Paul's prayer was, that Philemon's understanding of this reality would continue to grow, that if you've trusted in Jesus, you've been united with him, brought into this closeness of relationship with him, and for the very same reason, You've also been connected to every other person who's been connected to him in the very same way. And Paul's appeal is for Philemon to respond to Onesimus in light of this connection. And to maybe uh, make the situation even more significant, what we also find is that he's not just writing about the situation from afar, but Paul has written the letter and placed it into the hands of Onesimus himself and then sent him back that Onesimus has made the journey all the way from the city of Rome back to the city of Colossae to deliver this letter to the man that he wronged. And the interesting thing is, in this day and age, Philemon actually held the power of life and death over him. That because of the crime that Onesimus had committed, Philemon actually had every right to execute him, to take his life. And so Onesimus is going back to repair the relationship and the only thing standing between him and death, him and execution, is the effectiveness of Paul's words within this letter on his behalf. And so he's brought up the situation, and now he flows directly into his appeal. This is what he says, verse 12. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. That is the first half of Paul's appeal on Onesimus's behalf. And what you can see in the language is he's not commanding him, he's not forcing Philemon, and yet what he is clearly asking him to do, what he's appealing him to do is to take Onesimus, who's returning in a position of guilt, and to restore him not only to a place of innocence, but to actually take it one step further and set him free to change the status of their relationship altogether, to not, uh, to not just take him back as guilty, but to restore him to innocence and even to take it one step further and to set him free altogether. And there's a beautiful connection here between Paul's appeal and the gospel because effectively what he's asking Philemon to do on behalf of Onesimus is what Jesus has, be, has done on behalf of each and every one of us that in living the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, could never live, in dying on the cross in our place to pay for our guilt, for our debt, and then rising from the grave, Jesus has made the very same thing possible for us, that by placing our trust in him, 
And by that step alone, we're taken not only from a position of guilt to innocence, but even from that, from innocence to righteousness. Because he paid the price for our debt on the cross and then his perfect life is transferred to you and I so that we stand before him as righteous, not for a day, not for an hour, not until we mess up again, but forever. And in that, there is incredible freedom, including even the freedom to extend that forgiveness to others. And that's why Jesus empowers us to set others free. And that's really the idea that Paul is expressing here to Philemon and asking him to do the very same thing for Onesimus that Jesus has already done for him. He's asking him to offer forgiveness and to set him free. And so that's the first chunk of Philemon's, of Paul's appeal. And then in the second half, Paul moves into it a little bit further. And I think if there's something important to note at this point, it's that there is a relationship between freedom and forgiveness. And you can see that woven throughout the letter. And so what I wanna do is just read the second half of his appeal, take the letter to its close. Thankfully, it's not a super long letter. And then uh, just comment on forgiveness and freedom and the relationship between them a little bit. So verse 17, starting here. So if you consider me a partner, Paul's saying, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you and answer to your prayers. I almost think that's Paul's way of saying, uh, when as soon as I'm set free, I'm coming to see how you responded to the letter. (laughs) And then he closes out saying, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that is the letter, one of the shortest letters in the New Testament, one of the shortest books in the entire Bible. And I think what we see at this point is that Onesimus had the courage to return, to try and repair the relationship, to do what he could. And Paul wrote the best letter that he could to appeal on his behalf, and yet, what's fascinating is we never actually get to see the end of this story. That we never actually get to see how Philemon responds, right? You don't get to see Onesimus kind of walking up the drive, coming into the house, being there as the church gathers, seeing how Philemon responds to him, watching him read the letter. You don't get to see all of that. We don't get to see the end of the story, but in a way, that's intentional. Because rather than having the story provide for us the resolution that we desire, what it does is it takes the question that naturally arises, how did Philemon respond? And it turns it around and asks that very same question to each and every one of us. Question being, how will you respond in your own relational brokenness? In the broken relationships in your life, in the conflict in your life, How will you respond? The letter brings us to a place where we understand the situation. We know the circumstances and probably even have some desire for Philemon to respond in a certain way. And yet the question is, how will we respond in our own relational brokenness? And I think one really important thing when it comes to navigating the relational brokenness that we all feel within this life is the concept of forgiveness. The concept of forgiveness and even its interplay with freedom. Because I think it's worth asking that question and considering it on two different sides of the coin. How will we respond to the relational brokenness within our lives? I think it's worth asking it from the position of Philemon, right? If we are the person who's been wronged in some way, who's been harmed in some way, how will we respond? And forgiveness is one option. But I wanna be clear about what forgiveness is because forgiveness is, uh, I think there's been some, uh, unfortunately, some unclarity, some lack of clarity done around what forgiveness is, how it's practiced and how it's to be done that hasn't been particularly helpful. And so uh, here at SMCC, one 
definition we have used in the past is that forgiveness is releasing another from having to make it right. That it's releasing another from having to make the payment on what went wrong. Because anytime there's harm within a relationship, anytime there's brokenness within a relationship, there's a relational debt that is incurred. And in order to make the relationship right again, that has to be paid. It can't just be ignored. It can't just be kind of sidestepped. It has to be settled in order for the relationship to actually be repaired and to move forward. And forgiveness is choosing to make the payments on behalf of the other person to say, I'm no longer holding you to make these payments. I'm no longer expecting you to pay in this particular way. That doesn't necessarily mean the relationship is restored, that trust is restored in the same way, but it's saying, I'm no longer expecting you to make this right, and I'm making that payment on my own. And I think what Jesus has done for us in the gospel gives us the resources to be able to do that very thing. But it's also worth considering from the other side of the coin, right? That we may also be the one at times, it's possible that we could also cause harm in relationships. That we could also be the one to hurt others, to offend others, to cause the break in the relationship. And the question on that side is, are we willing to do what we can to repair the relationship? And Onesimus, I think in this story is incredible that he's willing to actually make the journey. If you think about it, he's lower class, right? And so he's not someone who has an incredible amount of resources, and yet he's willing to make the journey all the way from the city of Rome back to Colossae, knowing his life is on the line to do what he can to repair this relationship. And I think the question is, how will we respond when we've been the one to cause harm? And if anything, I think sometimes the tendency can be when we enter into those conversations to try and get the other person to see our side of things, to understand where we're coming from, why we acted the way we did, why we said what we did, what we were thinking, what we were feeling, the pressure that we were under. And that's not always necessarily wrong, and yet I think what's really underneath that uh, desire and, and moving about it in that way is the desire to justify ourselves. That if we can justify ourselves in the conversation, then that will make the relationship right. But if we're trying to justify ourselves, then what we're really not doing is asking for forgiveness. Instead, we're trying to be justified. And I think what can be far more helpful at times is just to simply say these phrases, I'm sorry, I was wrong, will you forgive me? They are short, they are simple, they're not always easy to say. They are powerful. Sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And so the question again is, how will you, how will I, how will we respond in our own relational brokenness? And I think if there's one other angle on this I wanna explore before we bring our time to a close and move on out to hot dogs and fireworks, it would just be this the idea of authority that Paul introduced at the beginning. The question being, how does the authority within your life lead you to respond to your own relational brokenness? Because if your authority is a religious one, that's primarily religious in nature, I think what that can have a tendency to do is on the one hand, and in terms of our relationships, all of a sudden offering forgiveness, extending forgiveness becomes not a choice, right? If you notice Paul, he never forces Philemon to do it. He never actually commands him, but what religious leaders will often do is say that this is something you have to do. This is a condition of your relationship with God. This is a box you need to check and a rule you need to keep, and if you don't, then all of a sudden that puts you in not so great terms with God himself. And when it comes to actually receiving forgiveness from God, that's not a gift, that's something you have to earn through the rules and by checking the boxes. But the thing is, if forgiveness is earned, then at the end of the day, it's not really forgiveness at all. So I think religion has a particular way of really kind of messing up how forgiveness operates within our relationships with one another and even within our relationship with God. But in the same vein, irreligious authorities often mess this up as well. Because if you notice, Irreligion doesn't have a whole lot of avenues for forgiveness 
or a whole lot of ability to offer forgiveness once you have crossed a certain line. Right, that there is a threshold that once you have passed it, you have gone too far, and there is no such thing as forgiveness. There is no such thing as redemption. There is no such thing as coming back. The condemnation is all there is, because forgiveness is not an option. So I think both have their troubles when it comes to forgiveness. And that's why Paul makes it very clear from the opening line of the letter that his authority is none other than Jesus Christ himself who by living the perfect life, who by making the payment on our debt with his life on the cross, and then rising from the grave in victory, he has brought us forgiveness. He has set us free. He has given us freedom to know that never again do we have to worry about earning his good graces, about earning his approval, but we can live in the forgiveness we have received each and every day as a gift. And in doing so, we have the ability to also extend that to others. And even to know that we don't have to be perfect. And so if we mess up, and when we mess up, because we will mess up, it's okay to acknowledge that we're not perfect and to ask for forgiveness. Because of what he's done, we know we don't have to be. So the bottom line is Jesus is the only way to real freedom the only path to real freedom. And that's what Philemon shows us. So would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the time together this morning. Thank you uh, for this short little letter that um, even in its brevity, it is dense with uh, so many rich ideas and the connections between forgiveness and freedom and authority. And I just, I pray that in a room this size, you, you know that there have to be people who are in the midst of relational difficulties, uh, challenges, um, relational brokenness, and trying to navigate through it. And I thank you that you don't leave us in the dark about how to do that, but you give us wisdom, you give us counsel, you even give us the opportunity to be a part of a community where we can be supported as we navigate through it. So I pray for those who are in the thick of it right now, that, uh, that you would give them um, a community to support them, relationships they can lean into, and even the courage and the wisdom to know how to approach asking for and offering forgiveness uh, where it's needed and where they find great joy, peace, and freedom in doing so. All this uh, we ask in your name, amen. Amen, all right, so since it's a holiday weekend, we're closing things down a little bit different this weekend. I'm not gonna sing a song because that would be an awful close to the service, but instead, I'm gonna invite you to stand and I just wanna read the closing line of Philemon. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up and uh, then at the, very, at the very end of the letter, Paul just ends with this, uh, basically a prayer on their behalf. And what I wanna do is close out just by reading this line. It's short, um, it's only a single sentence, so don't be surprised at how quick it goes, but um, just read it as a prayer on behalf of all of us before we make our way on out. So here it is. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message and trusting us with your time. If you'd like to connect with one of our pastors or staff, you can easily do that by visiting smccutah.org slash connect. When you fill out that quick form, they will get back to you within a few days and be able to connect with you. As well, if you'd like to know more about taking a next step at SMCC, you can easily look at what next steps we have by visiting smccutah.org slash next steps. And lastly, if you found today's message both hopeful and helpful, I would encourage you to do maybe one of two things. First, you can share this message with someone that would find it helpful. And you can also choose to partner with us financially so that more people can see messages like this. You can find more information on what that looks like by visiting smccutah.org slash give. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you at one of our locations soon.